So hi, I'm Monty Mython, Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk, and I'm delighted to be introducing a mini-series entitled Fluid Matters. So this is part three of Fluid Matters, our six-part mini-series. Once again, this is recorded at the Perioperative Quality Initiative, held in Durham in North Carolina in the USA early this year. And it's entitled Fluid Responsiveness and Venous Capacitance. The conversation is led by Desiree Chapel, who's our anchor in the USA, our lead for Top Med Talk, but also a nurse anaesthetist, so she was participating in this group, Group 2. Joined by familiar voice to Top Med Talk, Professor Mike Grocott, an anaesthetist intensivist from Southampton in the UK, and a co-director of the Perioperative Quality Initiative that organised this meeting. They're joined by very special guest, Dr David Kausman, who's an associate professor and director of the Medical Intensive Care Unit at NYU School of Medicine, and Dr Greg Martin, who, among other things, is research director at the Emory Critical Care Centre in the USA. Top Med Talk. All right, welcome back. My name is Desiree Chapel, host of Top Med Talk, and we are here in Durham, North Carolina at Pokey 5 and coming to you with our special edition, Fluid Matters. So we've been here the last couple days with a group of experts in fluid management and uh, we've been separated into two groups and you guys heard from Monty and uh, other members of his group, the Total Body Water and Electrolyte group. And we were in um, the second group, which we started out as intervascular volume and uh, fluid responsiveness. So I'm joined today here with our recurring special friend, Mike Grocott. You might Good afternoon, Desiree. Yeah, yeah. And we also have um, some special guests. So we have the lead author for Group A, Consensus, and uh, it's Greg Martin. Greg, thanks for coming on. Can you tell us where you're from? Sure. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm Greg Martin. I'm a faculty member at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And then we also have one of our other Pokey participants in Group A, David Kaufman. David, can you give us a little bit about where you're from? And- sure. My name is David Kaufman. I'm the director of the medical ICU at New York University NYU Medical Center. Just to kind of dive right into it, I was just hoping that, Greg, you can kind of start us off and tell us about where we started with uh, fluid responsiveness and intervascular volume and, and where we were starting with that. Right. That's a good question. And And it's really started because it's such an important topic that has relevance in almost everything we do for patient care. And when you think about the the two components together, the fluid, sort of the fluid status, intravascular volume component, we often think of that particularly over years more about fluid responsiveness, helping us understand whether fluid, whether giving fluid would be beneficial for the patient. And as we work through this, we realize that there's a variety of limitations to intravascular volume, both in the measurement of it and the interpretation of it. So we've evolved our thinking a little bit through the last couple days to think much more about um, ways that fluid status can change in an individual and the role of venous capacitance and how that's an important factor in mobilizing fluid in response to hypovolemia, for instance, and really the evolving thinking around that so that we can better help people to understand how that role or the role of venous capacitance for interpreting the use of uh, fluid responsiveness and measures for fluid resuscitation. Yeah. So what was our work- working title now that we have? We've moved to focus on two particular issues, which I think we identified as fundamental concepts. Fluid responsiveness, which was there in the original brief. Uh, and as Greg's mentioned, uh, venous capacitance has really come to the fore as an issue which is arguably a little bit neglected. So we think a lot about the arterial side of the circulation. I think we tend to think a little bit less about the venous side and a bit less about the relationship between uh, volumes and pressures and capacitance in that con- capacitance in that context. So, so that's where our focus has been over most of the last couple of days. I mean, I think that what we're trying to help our readers eventually understand is when we as clinicians decide to give intravenous fluid, how is the fluid going to help a patient? It's helpful to break that down into a series of steps. And we believed as a group that it was important uh, to understand the venous return to the heart as uh, one of the first important steps on the pathway of intravenous fluid potentially helping a patient. And we thought that the concept of venous elastance and capacitance is an important uh, idea that our readers and our listeners start to understand and how to interpret all of these other topics in fluid responsiveness. Yeah, because right, one of the things we talk about in Pokey or this session was the physiology, but then the, the clinical implications of it. Yeah, so there's a couple of really important concepts. One is that 
overall, when we think about fluid therapy or other therapies we're using in, in patients uh, in the perioperative setting, the, over go- the overall goal is usually targeted at the macro circulation because those are the things that we can measure and we focus on those. But the goal is often really to make sure that we're supporting or enabling normal cellular function to the extent that that can occur. And if we think about that as sort of the overarching goal and sort of leading, presuming that that then leads to better patient outcomes, that's part of that goal. And then we think about, okay, how does the amount of fluid that someone has and recognizing the limitations of intravascular volume, you can then start to think about venous capacitance, knowing that the majority of blood in an individual's body is in the venous system. So moving that system to mobilize fluid, for instance, if someone begins to become hypovolemic or hypotensive, mobilizing fluid from what we call the unstressed volume, that volume that's not necessarily participating in sort of the the normal blood pressure or the response of fluids, that can then help to do this. And there are interventions that we use, like vasopressors or things, that would influence that as well. So to begin to pull all those pieces together and say venous capacitance is important, we realize that a lot of the blood in circulation is actually in the venous system, and A lot of the interventions we do are actually targeted towards that, but it also helps us explain why fluid resuscitation may or may not work. Sometimes we give it and it doesn't have the expected effect, or the other things that we do, like alpha agonists or catecholamine drugs, would actually affect that as well. And that helps us to better understand the goals of restoring normal perfusion or addressing the impact of patients in a perioperative or critical care setting. Yeah, I wanted to add to that that as a group, we struggled a great deal with how do we reconcile the larger observations that what we do clinically in 2018 is largely targeted towards what we call the macro circulation, right? That is venous return, stroke volume, cardiac output, arterial pressure, and our relative inability to understand how manipulating those variables upstream may or may not affect the microcirculation, and then cellular metabolism. And I think that we struggled a lot with how do we convey these ideas, which are quite complicated and also really obscure ideas. And they're obscure for a lot of reasons. They're obscure because they're difficult to understand, and they're obscure because we have not a great uh, body of data that help describe them. And, and, And so how do we convey these uncertainties in a position paper? And how do we help our readers and our listeners understand that it may not necessarily flow from A to B to C in this linear fashion that you make the macrocirculation better, and therefore, ipso facto, you make the microcirculation better, and therefore, ipso facto, you make the cellular function better. And I think Dr. Grocott and his team have done really beautiful research on helping us understand how the, the microcirculation and cellular metabolism may get altered in order to adapt to these uh, conditions of scarcity. Yeah. Mike, um, I mean, some of these conversations we had uh, about stress versus unstressed volumes, and that, that was a term that was new to me. Um, and, and background for uh, Greg and David, you guys are not anesthesiologists, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> so this right. pokey so, was a true, we're multidisciplinary. We're, all, we're not just anesthesia. We're coming from different backgrounds. So, um, Greg, what is your background? So my background is pulmonary and critical care, and my area largely has been around fluid therapy, but it's mostly around conditions like sepsis and acute respiratory distress syndrome, where fluid therapy may be vitally important both on the resuscitation administration end as well as on the evacuation end. Yeah. And David? It's the same kind of background, internal medicine, then pulmonary critical care with... Uh, research experience in ARDS and sepsis. A long time ago, I played around with endothelial cells in culture and looked at how they reacted to fluid flow. So I know a little bit about that, and although I was basically uh, intellectually a kid at that time. So <laughs> I don't know if my ideas were any good. Yeah, well, the, yeah, Mike. Uh, well, I, I guess concept, the physiology is still the same. Hmm. Yeah. So the, the way, though, uh, I mean, we talked, uh, we talked a lot of sophisticated talk, but actually in the... In the uh, Straightforward conveyance. We spent a lot of lot of time talking about pumps and pipes, <laughs> so that so that we were all clear <laughs> that we were yeah. sharing the same uh, the same nations. Uh, and the pumps and pipes and the way they perform, pumps and tubes, are, are essentially the, the same. There are contextual differences in that the perioperative patient typically arrives well. Obviously, that's a little bit different in emergency surgery, and they don't necessarily have the 
profound uh, circulatory and inflammatory disturbances that we see in, the, in, for example, a septic critically ill patient. And therefore, there's, some, there's a little bit of reframing required. And the uh, clinical trial literature is different. So uh, as an example, this notion of, uh, sort of optimization, increasing or maximizing stroke volume, that's something that we're pretty sure in critical care doesn't make a lot of difference. And indeed, there are, there are studies uh, historically where that's caused harm, whereas I think it's reasonable to say that the balance of evidence in the perioperative setting is that that's beneficial. Uh, and so we had to take that into account. So I know a lot of people on the ground don't have anything to monitor stroke volume. They don't have new fancy monitors. Um, and so all we have is MAP a lot of times. So what was the consensus about using MAP versus stroke volume? And, and where do we end up on that? Um, Greg? So the I think the key there is that when we think about optimizing fluid status is to make sure you're individualizing it and using something to help guide your therapy. And stroke volume or measure, both measures of stroke volume or variations in stroke volume can be very useful for that. But we recognize that either trying to challenge people, like using passive leg raising to determine fluid responsiveness may not be feasible in some settings, like in the operating theater. But in other areas, you may not have the monitoring capability of having stroke volume or stroke volume variation, in which case you have to rely on other measures. And so blood pressure can be one of those, blood pressure and heart rate together, both sort of individually or in combination. And this all sort of, sort of falls back to regular physiology that you would expect that if you give someone fluid and their, their cardiac output or stroke volume goes up, you would expect that to potentially raise their blood pressure and potentially to lower their heart rate. So you can look at those individually, you can look at those together in combination, but there are some caveats to that. And we have to recognize that if you're unable to monitor stroke volume itself, that using these other surrogates that are at least one step removed have some challenges that go along with it. So very simply, as an example, if you do passive leg raising, conceptually you may raise someone's legs and you may cause some pain because they have some hip arthritis. And if that happens, their mean arterial pressure may go up and that may make it look like they're fluid responsive when in fact all you've really done is cause pain or discomfort to that person. And that's just a simple example, but conceptually there are limitations to using it. But at the same time, physiology does hold true, and if you are improving stroke volume and or cardiac output, you would expect blood pressure to rise and usually heart rate to fall. And that's sort of the basic principles that we would rely upon. And then thinking back to sort of the, the basic principles is how do you scale your monitoring to make sure that you're providing what a patient would need? So if you're, whether you're doing stroke volume monitoring or not, or even more invasive monitoring beyond that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else were we talking about? That was uh, so. I guess something that David uh, may touch upon is uh, we've we've jumped forward to what can respond. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we discussed a lot, and I and I guess this was part of our journey from being about uh, fluid volumes to being to focusing on venous capacitance, was was this notion of the limitations of the concept or the measurability of intravascular volume. Yeah. We we spent a lot of time debating whether to include terms like hyper, u, or hypovolemia. And they're very tricky terms. I mean, I think they're tricky for two reasons. One is that uh, I think in common clinical use, they're, they're used quite vaguely, a little bit like the difference between saying dehydrated versus hypovolemic. We, we throw these terms around, and we're not often precise about how we use them. And, and I think we, by doing that, their, their meaning gets degraded a touch, and, and I, that makes them difficult. And then I think that different, uh, depending upon your perspective, different definitions of hypo, hyper, or euvolemia may arise. For example, I think nephrologists, uh, you know, kidney specialists, see this world quite differently from maybe intensivists or cardiologists or anesthesiologists. And And we decided to focus more on the contextual definition of blood volume, which is that if a person appears to have poor perfusion based on our clinical judgment, that hypovolemia can, in that specific context, effectively be defined as somebody whose perfusion improves when that person receives additional volume loading. And so it's a very, it's a very uh, practical definition but we wanted to make sure that we stayed away from the terms hyper u and hypovolemia because we didn't want to confuse people. And so we really tried to focus on volume responsiveness as the central concept and as the signal to clinicians that when a cl clinician suspects that a person has poor perfusion, the next question that the 
the person should ask herself is, okay, will giving volume help? And that these different indices of volume responsiveness provide one piece of information that you can put into your decision-making uh, you know, matrix to try to come up with good clinical decisions at the bedside. And I guess I mean, one of those key decisions uh, that we all face is, is low blood pressure. Are we going to uh, give fluid? Are we going to squeeze? Are we going to use a, an alpha agonist, for example? And I think one of the important uh, steps on the journey has, has been clearly explaining the physiology of why you might do one or other of those uh, particular uh, actions and, and, and how that relates to venous, venous capacitance and these notions of stressed and unstressed volume and, uh, and microcirculatory perfusion. And I think, I think it, it took us like a day and a half of the two days to get to a point where we were able to uh, to really achieve clarity on that. But I think I think we got there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we came up with some really good practical uh, take home messages. You know that we can that we can use. Another concept that I think frequently used in uh, the clinical setting that we kind of ha- had much debate about was preload and what that really meant. And I think. I mean, there was a lot of discussion. We all kind of said different things. So, uh, you know, for me every day, I mean, I have someone tell me, oh, we need to, inc-, you know, it's all about preload. So Greg, what do you think? Where'd we end up on that? So you're right. We spent a lot of time thinking about this and preload is such a fundamental principle that it, it almost seems inherent that we would understand it. But when you try and actually nail it down, it becomes it's more difficult than wall. you think. <laughs> and so, you know, conceptually preload is, is again, pretty simple. We tend to think of it as the, the change in stroke volume due to an increase in diastolic volume, at least from the cardiac preload perspective. Um, and so if you think about that, that's pretty simple. That probably applies to all the settings we would think of. And then we'd spend a lot of time thinking about fluid responsiveness as sort of a measure of that. And fluid responsiveness has both that contextual definition that you're going to give fluids, presumably increase in diastolic volume, and that'll, that'll result in an increase in stroke volume. But then there's also the more sort of clinical definition, like how do you define fluid responsiveness at the bedside? Like what what are you going to recommend or what are you going to do to do that? And it's both how do you define it and then how do you test for it? Because those are two separate components as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, David, so did we decide it was important that we actually put that in, in the consensus? Because I, I think I, I don't know if I had ended up with clarity on that. I don't know that I ended up with too much clarity on it either. I think... Um, Look, I'm just a simple pulmonologist, and and I'm not probably sophisticated like the cardiologists are, or a cardiac anesthesiologist to really understand preload. Well, I, so, I, I, <laughs> sorry to interrupt there, but one of the things I was struck by was when we, when we were you know actively reviewing the literature during the process was the uh, the cardiological literature, which clearly demonstrates that there are a wide diversity of definitions even in that context. So that so there's a recent review suggesting 29 yeah. separate definitions, which which I found extraordinary. Yeah, that's exactly right, and it's one of the challenges that we came across is both in understanding preload and understanding fluid responsiveness and understanding fluid bolus or fluid challenge. All these things that we think are honestly relatively straightforward turn out not to be so. Well, I mean, and you you said it, Desiree, right? It's it's like nailing jello to the wall, and, and I think that the the take home message after after talking about these terms and these definitions is to be really humbled yeah. that um, our community uh, has a very imperfect grasp on what it is we're talking about and what it is we're trying to solve. And, and, and I'm, I feel privileged to be part of a group that's helping to define how we're going to try to address those deficiencies and make our community and make our patient care better uh, as next steps. So I think it's exciting, but it's also, it's also really humbling. Yeah. The process of, I mean, the process of it to, to, um, <clears throat> you know, like I said earlier, we kind of get into the weeds of some of these things. And sometimes, you know, the, the actual process of coming out of it and coming to a consensus was some, some pretty cool stuff. Um, just a, a couple more points, um, before we, uh, head out for the day and, and finish up here for the weekend. Um, one is, uh, specifically talking about the, the fluid bolus, the fluid, the fluid challenges and, and fluid responsiveness. And, um, you know, I have a lot of people ask me about, um, wh- what is it, how do I need to do these fluid challenges? Um, where do I need to turn to look for that information? Um, and you know, we're talking about fluid, fluid responsiveness. What were some of the recommendations that we had for that? It's a really great question because it's, it came down that we thought, again, relatively simple concept, but when you look at the practicality of it, there's so much variability in the way it's been 
both studied and implemented, that there's not a simple answer. So one of the things we really endeavored to do is to come up with a methodology that we could suggest, some, sort of the most common approach that people might use. Mm-hmm. So again, if you think about fluid responsiveness, the idea that there's recruitable stroke volume that can be achieved or accomplished by giving fluids, then we came back and said, okay, well, the, the most common method for testing fluid responsiveness is the administration of 250 cc's of fluid over 15 minutes or less, sort of as rapidly as possible, and defining a positive response by at least a 10% increase in stroke volume. So that gives us very specific parameters that you can walk to the bedside, you can utilize, and you can define. And in fact, um, it's it's the kind of thing that hopefully will standardize the way we might build approach this. And one of the things we recognize in all the things, not just this, but is there's a certain level of area, there's a certain amount of uncertainty that we have in these things. So there's a research agenda that has to come with this too. And one of them is obviously trying to standardize or better understand this because as you might anticipate, not all fluids are the same. Not all administration times are the same. Sometimes vac- vascular access varies. And it might even vary by patient condition. We talked about what about patients with reduced ejection fraction or patients with diastolic heart failure or other sort of conditions that might change the cardiovascular dynamics in those patients with a fluid challenge. So we talked about monitoring stroke volume, and that was going to be the gold standard. Um, and then uh, u- utilizing passive leg raises and things like that. Uh, stroke volume variation, pulse pressure variation. And so... We talked we talked quite a bit about this as well and using those and and how those how effective those really are, um, especially in the patient populations that we're taking care of uh, in the perioperative phase of care. So right, so the it's really important because we have a real sort of growth in technologies that allow us to do more discrete patient monitoring, and now that we can do that both sort of all the way from highly invasive through fairly completely non invasive. We can now apply those, and they do vary a little bit. So there's things like stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variation that have been tested over many years and demonstrated to be effective ways to predict fluid responsiveness. But one of the challenges in those is that they are imperfect, right? So they they have a predictive value usually between 80 and 90% accurate, but that doesn't mean that every person who tests positive will, in fact, respond. So there's, there's always limitations. But then there's the other tests that we think about, too, that are maybe a little bit different. So, for instance, we do passive leg raising, but we might do that in patients where you're particularly concerned about giving fluids, so you don't want to give the fluids, in which case you'll essentially do an auto-transfusion, moving blood from the lower extremities up into the thorax and using that as a methodology. Or for ventilated patients, you can use index respiratory occlusion tests and other things that might be descriptive or help to understand are they fluid responsive. At the end of the day, um, any of those tests can be really helpful, but you have to interpret them in the context of the patient. So just because someone's fluid responsive does not necessarily mean that you would give them fluids. And one of the points we made is that a lot of us probably sitting around the table would have preload recruitable stroke volume. You could give us fluids and our stroke volume would go up, but that doesn't mean that we need fluids. We're all functional, hopefully normal human beings. And so when you see a patient in, the, in a more medical context, you have to take the data that you have, fluid responsiveness measures, for instance, and apply that to the individual patient in front of you and decide, is there a clinical condition? Is there something that's going on with this patient that would indicate that I should give them fluids knowing that they're fluid responsive? Yeah. Mike, uh, did you make, want to make a point? Yeah, well, I think one of the, uh, in that regard, the sort of important synthesis that we achieved actually relatively late in the day was, was the, um, this understanding that we can manipulate preload through fluids so we can add to the intravascular volume with a, a fluid challenge. Uh, or we can manipulate preload uh, through uh, other method of, of through manipulating the venous capacitance, mm-hmm. uh, and that the vasoactive drugs that we think about a lot in terms of arterial mm-hmm. tone, so both dilators and constrictors, also act on the venous circulation. And if, for example, we give an alpha agonist and in, uh, increase venous tone, we're going to reduce the capacitance of the system, so the effective volume's gone up, and we, we talked about you know the, the increase the stressed volume at the expense of the unstressed volume. Uh, which which doesn't sound too scary until you you interpret that as the, the unstressed volume is the bit that's hanging out in the microcirculation and keeping the cells alive, and and that makes a lot of sense to this you know will I use a fluid bolus or will I use a presser because you really got to make sure your stressed volume is fully resuscitated before you start squeezing which is what we all do in clinical practice but I, I think sometimes we we don't think through the underlying physiology and why that makes sense right yeah robbing Peter to pay Paul exactly <laughs> yeah. 
And, you know, it's, we're seeing that in some of the literature that's coming out with the, you know, the relief trials talking about restriction and what you're having to do to support blood pressure. Usually they're going, you know, and those patients having to use, you know, constrictors and seeing all kinds of, of, of issues. So, um, well, any final thoughts for today? Take home messages. What do you think of the process? So the process is great, right? I mean, it sort of goes through a, a multi-professional, sort of widely diverse group of people working together to, I think, hopefully develop a better understanding and, and a clinically useful platform that can help people to deliver care. Um, the The process is great, too, in the sense that it makes you think very broadly about these things. So this concept that we talked about, stressed and unstressed volume and venous capacitance, clearly have been known for many years, but not widely think thought about in this context. And so putting all those together and trying to integrate those into the way you would manage patients, I think is very valuable and hopefully will be helpful. David? I'm just, I'm hopeful that our readers and our listeners will take this as a cue to try to explore this area more. I mean, what we're really trying to do is ask people to think about cause and effect and how when you make an intervention, what are the downstream follow-on steps that happen that we think are going to lead to a goal that contributes to a better patient outcome. And some of those steps are really uncertain, but I hope that we encourage our readers and our listeners to think skeptically and critically about those steps because that's really the best way to do patient care. Mm -hmm. Mike, any final thoughts? I guess, I I, I mean, I love the process of Pokey. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's tiring, but it's a really sort of thought-provoking and challenging uh, set of interactions over, over a couple of days each time. Um, this one in particular, I really like, so that there's some really good basic physiology, but with some very clear clinical messages. And, and if a, a single take-home message, which is, which is actually what you introduced <laughs> into our group towards the end, is, is, is we're talking about the, the ideal physiology, but, but don't forget the pump about the pump and the tubes i.e. they vary between patients, so good hearts, bad hearts, you know, left ventricular dysfunction, you might be thinking about a smaller uh, fluid challenge, for example, and don't forget about the clinical context, because if there's blood hosing out of an artery during surgery, they definitely need some volume. (laughs) (laughs) Well, on that note, (laughs) um, again, gentlemen, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Top Med Talk. Nick Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk Fluid Matters. Don't forget, if you get yourself onto the internet now, you can download our entire back catalogue absolutely free of charge. We're itemising it and categorising it at the moment. It may not always exist in that form. We highly recommend you get yourself to the internet now, either via the Top Med Talk website, topmedtalk.com, or you go via your podcatcher and you dig out our entire back catalogue, get it all on the hard drive, and then you own everything we've ever done. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That's vital. And whilst you're at it, have a little look on social media where you can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn. We've even got our own YouTube channel. Obviously, we're on Facebook. We're all over the internet. Find us, subscribe to us, and join us online. And whilst you're doing that, get to the website and get on the emailing mailing list of ours. We have a brilliant email mailing list which keeps you up to date with how you can get more involved in top med talk including of course some of the meetings that we attend and if you want to find out about those right now go to ebpom.org forward slash meetings then you can see all of the big events that top med talk and the team are going to be at in the near future that's ebpom.org forward slash meetings